I've come to the German National Theatre in the middle of Weimar. There's a plaque on the wall that says, in this building, the National Assembly, having fled the political turmoil in Berlin, representing the German people, created the Weimar Constitution of August 1919. Thereafter, with the principles of democracy enshrined in the Constitution, and with the catastrophe of the First World War behind, there was a flourishing of culture. The era of the Weimar Republic from 1919 until the National Socialists were elected to power in 1933 was one of economic hardship and unprecedented political instability, but it was also a time of new modes of thought and culture. This was the era of cinema and Kurt Weill's threepenny opera, of free expression and Bauhaus design. Ernst Krenig's tragic opera, Orpheus and Eurydice, premiered in Leipzig in 1926, received a dearth of performances thereafter, while his Johnny Spielt Auf premiered in Leipzig just three months later, with his easy listening jazz riffs caught the mood of the moment, the sense of cultural freedom and emancipation, and was performed more than 400 times on various stages around the country in its first season alone. I'd like to look at one element of Weimar culture that, in my opinion, best expresses and represents the continuity of the Weimar identity thesis. The work of one of the second generation of phenomenologists, Martin Heidegger. Heidegger accepted a professorship at the University of Freiburg in the southwest corner of Germany in 1928, after the retirement of Edmund Husserl, who'd moved there during the First World War. It was he who led the turn back to Hegel, and then to the scholarship of ancient Greece in a quest to understand the nature of being, a move that eventually carried the phenomenological tradition all around Europe, and to Gadamer, who wrote of Hegel's work, We are consciousness looking on. That is the perspective of the phenomenology. While rejecting the notion of a realm of archetypes, Aristotle had posited that the study of all metaphysical existence should start with an exemplary type of being, the substance before the characteristic, the music before the musical components, and in turn the exemplary instance of that type, the exemplary substance of all things being the divine creator. In contrast, and despite sharing the same goal, that of defining the essence of existence underpinning both mind and nature, Heidegger argued against the notion of exemplary or paradigmatic being, and accordingly in favour of a new starting point. For this he looked to Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, written in Jena during the era of classical Weimar, because of its favouring of ontology over epistemology, its explorations of the being of the knower and the known, and the relationship between the two. He was less keen on Hegel's focus upon the role of reason, and the way ontology was supposed to become subsumed by dialectics, but this wasn't as problematic as Husserl's didactic focus on what was knowable about the knower and the known, which had necessarily privileged knowing as level three aspect of mind above level two qualitative phenomena of raw experience. If the Weimar identity thesis had sought to locate the links between mind and nature by way of analogy, Heidegger sought to locate intrinsic identity by way of essential existence. He insisted that, before dealing with knowledge of nature, the subject must understand the being of the thing known. They must understand the being of an entity before looking to understand its empirical properties. They must comprehend the nature of its existing before the nature of its existence. Whereas Husserl had looked at qualitative experience free of convention, Heidegger looked to the implication of that experience as regards the nature of existence. Heidegger described the being of objects in daily life, those things that are not art, such as dishes and tablecloths, toothbrushes and soap bars, as ready to hand. In the same way that we use our mouths and vocal cords for singing without a second thought, assuming we're healthy, or our hands for holding a musical instrument, such as a trumpet, by way of automatic responses of the nervous system and without an immediate conscious awareness of what we're doing, so we use ordinary objects in the same way. 
We relate to a music stand or a chair or a pen or a pencil as if they were an extension of our nervous system, of our mind and body. Dasein experiences a box, not as Husserl describes the experience, viewing it from different sides, retaining a representation of the image and synthesizing a conception of the box, but as existing for something. The dimension and physical object are hardly noticed. Instead, it's aesthetical or purposeful or historical or located in another meaning. The box is an object of use and engagement. Heidegger went on to argue that, in contrast, objects treated as art are not taken for granted in the same way, and therein they impose upon human existence an awareness of fundamental truth. Heidegger said that the world of human utility is in a state of continuous struggle with the materials from which that world is made. A door handle might jam, or a chair break, or a pencil grow blunt, which disrupts their status. These things happen to art objects too, but in contrast, the aesthetic qualities of that art reveal not the struggle itself, but the essence of the struggle. Thomas Ventsner stated that Heidegger even declares the question concerning being the proper and sole theme of philosophy. He argued that the essence of being, the Dasein, had been ignored in the clamour for knowledge of beings. There had not even been an awareness of the ontological distinction between the two. Beings are mortal entities, plants and animals, the bodies that are the vehicles for minds. But being is the intrinsic essence of existence. Beings are discrete and separate from each other in the world, but being is a foundational edifice of what exists. Heidegger went on to posit three kinds of being, using an ontological structure that matches the three levels of mind I characterised at the beginning of this inquiry. Firstly, there's the aspect of being that exists, in the same way that the entity of mind might be said to exist. Secondly, there's the aspect of being that describes what that being is, in the same way that the entity of mind is described as having the character of conscious self-awareness. And thirdly, there's the manner or type of the entity's being. For instance, the fact that it's a thing and not a characteristic of another thing, which determines its function in the world, in the same way that processes of mind determine the function of mental states. Heidegger focused above all on level two being, the characteristics of being, which he confusingly called the entities. He says their being includes a surrounding context, and ultimately the being of the world as a contextual whole. For instance, the characteristics of numbers do not exist outside the context of numeracy. The characteristics of a living creature do not exist outside of the context of life. One of the most important constructions in Weimar during the Weimar Republic period, besides the Weimar Halle, which I'll visit later, somewhere that also represents cultural emancipation, is a local outdoor swimming pool, the Schwanbad. And I've come here with my family on a beautiful sunny summer's day. There could be nowhere better for considering how human beingness is the sign, the beingness of being in the world. The sign is the experience of all three levels of mind unified as one. It's the identity of all aspects of mind with experience. It's the sign that asks, what is the sign? It's the sign that asks all the questions in an inquiry, including, what is the being of the being that asks the question? The sign is an entity for which, in its being, that being is an issue. In his magnum opus, Being and Time, Heidegger said that all ontology is rooted in the phenomena of time. Authentic design is aware of time and perceives the past, present and future in the context of birth and death and beyond. Only the present can be experienced empirically, yet the sign perceives temporality as a tangible entity with its own characteristics. Human existence is a tiny speck in the time and space of the universe. Yet the unity of Dasein banishes the possibility of negligibility and meaninglessness. It gives the universe significance. Only with Dasein did time begin, not with an exterior creator suffering the delusions of eternity and omniscience. And the semantic of time is thereafter critical to Dasein. Heidegger argued that, for many people, whatever the frivolous artifice of the modern era, apprehension about their inevitable demise and death 
acts to spur them to rise from a would-be metaphysical abyss into great awareness of matters of import, and in particular that of being. Dasein is always ahead of itself, always considering future possibilities in its dreams and aspirations. Imminent death is one of these possibilities. When Dasein perceives its own being, it's already begun in time and heading towards its end. Death can occur at any moment and consequently the approach of Dasein towards finitude shapes its whole attitude. In contrast, authentic Dasein is aware of what approaches. Without death there will be continual procrastination, but with it there is urgency. The subject knows death encompasses both the physical body death and the mental finitude of being that resides in the mind. Dasein lives life in light of this awareness, anxious though not fearful. Unless, of course, it's distracted. Inauthentic Dasein, swayed by the idle banter of others and unable to listen to the self that's resident in phenomenal consciousness, chatters about death ambiguously, remotely. This was in part a consequence of the naturalist worldview that had created a subject-object distinction which in turn alienated people from nature and isolated them from one another. Heidegger argued that naturalism excludes the nature of being. He argued that the naturalist paradigm alienates people from life itself and causes them to live in an empty world of frivolities and inconsequentialities. But Heidegger also rejected the notion of justifying truth by way of a metaphysical reality which he perceived as a consequence of a false notion of dualism, separating the would-be subjective and objective realms. He called this approach to truth the ontotheological, which is driven by the tendency to locate hierarchy in objectivity, which in turn tends to create a false privileging of divine and transcendent truth. In contrast, Heidegger described truth as a process of unconcealment, Rather than regarding propositional assertions as possessive of logical bivalence as regards their correspondence to would-be real facts in the world, he argued that any assertion is nothing more than an artificial construct imposed upon something present at hand. He located the primary locus of truth only in the sign itself, which embodies the process of continually uncovering truth, shedding light upon it. Heidegger identified this as a fundamental error in metaphysics during the past two and a half thousand years, since the time of Socrates and beyond, the false assertion of dualist hierarchies of mind that led to God. He argued that Hegel's teleological dialectic, the ongoing development of mind through history and its orientation on freedom by way of the resolution of duality is fine in and of itself, but fails to locate the mechanism by which this journey might be accomplished. In contrast, Nietzsche had been able to achieve this metaphysical resolution by way of declaring the death of God, which enables the overcoming of the old ontotheology based upon dualism of object and subject. Dasein brings the whole world with it. Dasein creates a unitary, unified world rather than the collection of entities. Dasein is not a separate thing, it's at the centre unifying everything. Design comprises more than the ability to be aware of existence, but also to make decisions about how to be and how to create its own ways of being. It exists in possibilities in regards how to interpret the world. Heidegger argued that truth based on unconcealment provides a mechanism that allows beings to grasp their intrinsic being and, as already been indicated, this truth is made most accessible through art. Heidegger argued that art places truth within a living context. In this case, it's not a truth based on correspondence or representation of any kind. It's a natural process of revealing that, in turn, discloses the essential qualitative nature of existence, which is the nature of being. Heidegger argued that the truth revealed by art doesn't concern the content of a piece or its descriptive accuracy. Again, echoing the sentiment of Nietzsche, he argued that its truth lies in the acknowledgement of inexplicable suffering and the surmounting of the associated anguish. Heidegger argued that art is always able to extinguish the trivialities of everyday life by way of enabling a sense of insight into being. He said that art objects, whether paintings or sculptures or pieces of music, are not analogous to other objects in the world. Indeed, 
A tree treated as art becomes, in human terms, something greater than the biological organism. Sound treated as music is elevated, in human terms, to something superior. Any piece of music that's a work of art expresses authentic design, emancipated from object-subject dualism. It's not something into which the artist of the audience might project their subjective values. Instead, art reveals the essence of what the thing is. Heidegger said, art is a disclosure of the being of beings. The artwork might in itself be perceived as an object, but this should not imply it's a thing with artistic qualities added. Instead, its very being reveals the nature of nature. Art also creates its own world in which it belongs. In great art, the artist is effaced entirely so that all that exists is a unified whole. It's not possible to reduce it to component parts. All of the foundations, whether it's the artist who is creator, or whether it's a viewer or audience, or even the guardian of institutions, are equally indispensable to the union. Thomas Wartenberg stated that when Heidegger claims that art is the origin of the work of art, he puts the art object into the broader context of art practice, the primary reference of the term art, and claims that only by understanding the entire practice can we understand the work of art itself. Heidegger places music experience and its ontological nature in the context of practical experience, which is always changing my nature. Heidegger argued that the subject is an interpretative being in a cultural and intellectual context. Objects and events take on meaning only by way of their relation to the subject, and so it is with music. Heidegger chose as an example that of the Greek temple. He said that, as a work of art, it's a representation that explores the antagonism between the subjective and the objective. He said the temple was able to reveal a sense of disclosure by way of the subjective, and concealment by way of the objective simultaneously. The former in the sense that it provides a home for a community that could together discover a world of meaning, and the latter in the sense that the community must operate within the restrictions of a physical environment that involves limitations and suppression. He said this concurrence of disclosure and concealment exists in all artwork. Heidegger argued that all historical eras have experienced truth in a different manner by way of their particular art worlds. If ancient Greece allowed the gods to become present at hand in its temples, then a modern world allows ancient mythological agents to become present at hand through paintings and statues. Indeed, Heidegger went on to posit that being itself is perceived by phenomenal experience in terms of its specific historical circumstance. Accordingly, being is seen from a viewpoint that predetermines understanding of the being of beings. The Weimar Republic was brought to an abrupt closure when the National Socialists won power at the ballot box in 1933. At first, Heidegger became a member of the party, disillusioned as he was with the trivialities associated with the Weimar democracy, although he backtracked hastily after the instigation of a police state environment and the purging of universities, which sent many of his colleagues into exile. He remained in Germany and chose a path of silence and political neutrality. But after the war, accused of complicity, he refrained from atonement. After all, the sign possesses no responsibility for the world. It is the world. I'll finish with another section from the music that started this episode. This is the second movement from my piece, Holon. Thanks for listening.